Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome to the CR event today. We appreciate everyone joining us for a discussion. We look forward to our presentation. I'm Matt Pietrasi with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium along with Aid Environment and Profundo. CRR provides sustainability risk analysis for investors in soft commodities, and you can find our reports and our events at our website. Our focus today will be on China's links to, to Brazil's deforestation and our recent case study on Yum China. China is currently the world's largest meat producer and consumer and is seeing sharp increases in imported soy and beef from Brazil that have contributed to deforestation in the Cerrado and Amazon. During the first part of 2020, Brazil's soybean exports to China increased by almost 40% and Brazilian exports of frozen beef to China doubled. China is the leading destination of Brazilian soy-fed poultry and pork, accounting for almost 20% of total exports. Against this backdrop, a wide range of ESG risks are embedded in the beefs, poultry, and pork pro products that China consumes. That is, what we will, that is what we will be discussing today. A few housekeeping issues before we move forward. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A function and we will aim to answer after our main presentation. We will put an archived recording of the event on our website in the coming days. And once it's on our site, we'll, we'll, alert, we'll alert all of our readers. And now I'd like to hand it over to Barbara Cooper and Harard Reich of Profundo and Tim Steinweg of Aid Environment. Thank you, Matt. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm going to start with a brief introduction to the overall market links between Brazil and China. Could you switch to the next? Thank you. Um, yeah, agribusiness exports play a very important role for the Brazilian economy. And these exports have boomed in 2020 with several agri commodities actually breaking records. And these record highs in exports have been achieved despite the volatile economic outlook. There are different reasons that are driving this development. Firstly, the Brazilian real has been rapidly depreciating in the last months. Uh, there was a currency loss of around 43% against the value of the US dollar in 12 months from July. And secondly, the demand from China remained robust, which is extremely important, as we will see in a moment. An important part of these exports from Brazil is accounted for by soy and beef, as Matt mentioned already, and China is the key destination for that. The exports of frozen beef uh, saw an increase by 148% year on year in the first half of 2020, and also the exports of soybeans from Brazil to China saw a rapid increase by around 31%. Um, Sorry, that wasn't to China, that was overall. Uh, I'm going a bit too fast. China is the most important destination for these exports. China received 72% of Brazilian soybean exports and 52% of Brazilian beef exports. Um, for soy, it has to be considered though that um, overall exports consist of soybeans and soy meal uh, from Brazil. Oil is uh, negligible. But some other regions like Europe receive, for example, larger volumes of soybean meal. But in the exports of soybeans, China is clearly dominating. And even when looking at total exports from Brazil, it still accounts for more than 60%. At the same time, China has also heavily invested in, uh, in uh, the sectors in Brazil. The graphic on the left gives an impression of um, Chinese soy interests in Brazil based on investments between 2009 and 2020, which have a cumulative value of around $40 billion in various uh, segments of the supply chain from logistics to production and processing. For beef, these investments sum up to more than $10, million, $10 billion. The, the, the two commodities that I uh, now spoke about soybean and beef are actually the key drivers of deforestation in Brazil in the last years. The 
uh, cattle is the key driver of deforestation in the Amazon, while soybean cultivation has increasingly played a role in deforestation in the Cerrado and also in the Chaco biome further south in, uh, be, um, between Argentina, Paraguay and Bolivia. The next slide, please. So this figure gives an impression of the development of soy exports from Brazil. Uh, in orange, you see uh, the development on a monthly basis of soy exports uh, to China in the green shades to Europe and gray are other destinations. So what becomes very clear is that from beginning of 2018 until today almost, um, there is overall a, a very clear increase in exports that can be observed and the role of China has increased most in, in, the, in the different destinations. Um, as mentioned, China is predominantly importing soybeans for domestic crushing. That results in an average of 18.5% edible oil. Soybean oil is the most important oil in China, edible oil and 78.5% soy meal that is used in livestock feed. As Matt mentioned already, the livestock uh, production in China is uh, very big. Um, the key uses in, uh, of soy meal on the Chinese market are poultry, pork um, as the dominating sectors. These figures in the pie chart here give an impression of the, the distribution between different livestock sectors. It has to be kept in mind that these figures are already three years old. It's difficult to find this kind of um, data. Um, with this uh, African swine flu heavily decimating the, the pig herd, it can be assumed that the role of poultry in soy consumption on the Chinese market has even increased in the last two years since 2018 when African swine flu uh, became uh, a a problem in China and uh, meant that pork production was uh, going down a lot. The next slide, please. Um, this figure then looks at uh, China's pork, poultry and beef imports from Brazil, also in the period from beginning of 2018 until today, or the latest available data for August. Um, overall, there's a clear increasing trend that can be observed and especially um, pork and beef have increased during this time, um, which, which leads to the, to, um, there's, there's basically two types of uh, deforestation footprints that can be linked to these two uh, streams for soybean for soybean production, as I mentioned before, um, that's a very key driver of deforestation in the Cerrado biome in Brazil. For meat, it's a mix of beef being an important driver of deforestation in the Amazon, while poultry and pork, as mentioned before, and that's a similar pattern in Brazil, are consuming large volumes of soybean meal. So the exports to China have a, a, a more indirect deforestation footprint through the embedded soy in these products that are being uh, exported. Um, and with this, I'm finishing this short introduction. I would like to hand over to Tim to have a closer look at a Chinese company that is exposed to these supply chains. Thank you. Um, thank you, Barbara, and uh, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, maybe good night as well. Um, so I will be talking today about uh, a case study, which we think is quite illustrative for the topic at hand uh, today. So we are uh, talking about the company Yum China, on which Chain Reaction Research published a company profile back in July of this year. Um, when we published this, uh, it was a moment uh, at which uh, Yum China had announced, but not yet gone ahead with a secondary stock listing in Hong Kong. Um, that has uh, um, happened in between the publication of the report and this webinar. Uh, and my colleague Gerard will, will talk a little bit more about that. 
Um, we're talking about Young China today because we think it's, uh, it's illustrative for the type of companies that uh, feature in these supply chains that, that Barbara was talking about if we look a little bit further uh, downstream. So when we look at the, at the consumption of um, some of the meat products uh, and, and the companies involved in that, uh, Young China is, uh, is a good example. Um, so Young China is a, uh, is a, uh, a large company uh, it's a uh, restaurant company that operates nearly 10,000 restaurants throughout China. Uh, it employs almost half a million people uh, and it serves 2 billion customers uh, in Chinese customers uh, in the year 2019. Uh, so Yum China is primarily known uh, for operating the KFC, Taco Bell and Pizza Hut brands in China in addition to a number of uh, uh, Chinese dining formulas, uh, as well as coffee houses. Um, with the nearly 10,000 restaurants, um, it is the largest restaurant chain in China uh, already. Um, it has a business strategy that is quite clearly focused on high volumes and a strategic focus on rapid expansion. So in the last few years, uh, the company has reported opening on average uh, two or a little more than two restaurants, new restaurants every single day. Um, it has also conveyed the uh, intention uh, to reach uh, a total number of 20,000 stores, so almost doubling in size uh, compared to today uh, in the coming years. Now, purely because of the size and obviously also because of the, the types of, uh, of products it uh, offers through its restaurants, uh, this is a company that purchases a large amount of food ingredients, uh, including a number of forest risk commodities. Um, and I think the most notable of that uh, clearly is chicken um, through its KFC uh, brands primarily. Um, chicken being a forest risk commodity because of the uh, embedded soy or the, or the soy, as Barbara explained, that is used uh, as feed for the poultry. Uh, in addition to that, Young China also purchases volumes of, uh, of pork, uh, of beef, of other food ingredients, uh, cooking oil uh, and, and packaging. Uh, the company has a uh, integrated supply chain management system. Uh, it uh, conducts its uh, sourcing of ingredients in a, in a centralized manner. Uh, and it reports uh, sourcing the majority of its, uh, of its goods uh, through 800 primarily China-based suppliers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, just speaking a little bit about its poultry use. So while the company does not publish exact figures on its sourcing of any particular ingredient, um, executives have reported in media uh, figures around uh, 1 billion chicken, chickens being sourced on an annual basis. Um, so we uh, try to estimate what that means in terms of the market share for uh, the total Chinese uh, poultry or chicken consumption and based on average weights and, and uh, looking at a range uh, because 1 billion is a, obviously a, a suspiciously round number. Um, in our report, we, we made an estimation of between six, the one reported 1 billion chickens being equal to between 16 and 24% of all chicken consumption in China, going through a young China operated restaurants. Um, Following on that uh, uh, estimation, we looked at, okay, what does that mean then in terms of uh, embedded soy? So if you look at uh, um, the uh, overall uh, soy consumption in China, we know that approximately half of it is uh, of Brazilian origin. Um, so using that, we made an estimation um, ranging from between 1.0 and 1.8 million metric tons of Brazilian soy being embedded in the, in the chicken purchases of, uh, of this particular company. Um, if you compare that to the uh, total soybean production of, uh, of last season, 
that then represents uh, between 0.9 and 1.6 percent of all soybean production in Brazil for that year. Um, and so that is, uh, that is just to illustrate the volume uh, of this company. Um, and, and because it's such a large player, um, I think the, uh, the overall uh, characteristics of China's trade uh, in soy with Brazil is an indicative proxy of what may be the origin of the soy that's embedded in, in the chickens that Young China sources. And so we conclude that there is a, a high likelihood that at least some of this soy comes from areas that have a high risk of deforestation, uh, most notably uh, the Mato Piba region in Sahado uh, that uh, chain reaction research has, uh, has talked about frequently in the past. This is just a, an illustration of the, of the size of the, uh, of the exposure for poultry, uh, but also um, the beef and the pork, which it, uh, the company sources in uh, lower volumes, may add additional exposure, both because of the embedded soy as well as in the case of beef, uh, there may be a portion imported directly from Brazil uh, and, and thereby being potentially linked to, to deforestation risks as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the next thing that we did was we looked at uh, the extent to which this company mitigates uh, these deforestation risks that are clearly present um, in its supply chain, but relatively removed from the company's direct operations. So this is, uh, these are risks that are prevalent in you know, the second or third or beyond uh, tiers of, of the company's supply chain. What we see is that the company really only recognizes uh, risks of being linked to deforestation for the palm oil uh, that uh, is used as an ingredient in the cooking oil that, that the company sources, as well as the paper used for some of the packaging of its products. Um, it has some commitments for those specific commodities, although not best in class. Uh, but it has no commitments whatsoever for any soy and beef deforestation risks. Um, and because of that, uh, we conclude that the company underperforms uh, compared to a number of its peers. So what we did, which can be shown in the, in the table on the left, is we systematically analyzed the company's policies uh, against the core principles of the accountability framework the accountability framework is a, a set of commonly accepted norms and standards uh, for ethical sourcing uh, of agricultural commodities. Uh, and what we're seeing is that a number of other uh, fast food companies, retailers, uh, food service companies, uh, while not scoring full points, uh, do clearly have more ambitious policies and targets than, uh, than Young China. Um, and I think what, what, this, what this illustrates is that uh, the issues that we're talking about today uh, are not recognized as material sustainability issues. Um, and it, we, we think that this is indicative for uh, blind spots that we see uh, with numerous companies traditionally, whereby um, sustainability risks such as, such as uh, deforestation or fires or some of the other uh, adverse impacts that are further removed from the company's direct operations that are, that are beyond the first tier of uh, a company's supply chain uh, tend to be recognized less and tend to be a, a significant blind spot in some of, uh, some of the company's efforts. Next slide, please. And so we believe that this uh, unmitigated uh, indirect exposure to deforestation uh, adds to a number of uh, more prevalent business risks for young China. Um, so some of the risks that have been discussed uh, more frequently um, in media and among investors primarily relate to the impact of, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, this year the uh, measures taken in terms of social distancing, the uh, uh, reduced um, preference for, for dining outside of the homes uh, of, uh, of consumers, 
uh, in addition to uh, more tense US-China relations and the potential impacts that it can have for, for a company like Yum China that does have uh, uh, American uh, brand name restaurants. What we believe is that this supply chain deforestation could exacerbate some of these ongoing investor concerns. Uh, and primarily because of its, uh, uh, the combination of its uh, relatively poor ESG performance compared to its peers and its high risk exposure. Uh, this could lead to uh, the company being excluded from ESG funds, from other sustainability linked financing, in addition to a range of other uh, potential investor actions that, uh, that my colleague Gerard will talk about. Uh, and then obviously there is also potential for reputational risks uh, if uh, uh, supply chain deforestation remains unmitigated. Um, we're at a moment in time where uh, supply chain transparency, supply chain monitoring, insights in trade flows um, is greatly improving. Uh, a lot more data and a lot more capabilities are becoming available, which means that uh, these type of risks uh, could come and, and haunt companies that are further removed in their supply chain. Uh, that chance is more likely now than it was a few years ago. And again, this could be something that, that adds to uh, other changes in, in consumer preferences and, and possible changes in the sentiment towards US uh, images and US companies uh, in, in countries like China. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass it on to, uh, to Gerard to talk a little bit more about the quantification of the risks for any investors. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Tim. Um, well, all these observations by Barbara and Tim um, on uh, Brazil and Yum China, uh, they become, of course, much more interesting at the moment of a secondary listing, uh, which was announced and executed by uh, Yum Brands um, uh, of 2.2 uh, of billion uh, US dollars. So this company is, uh, is, is now more in the spotlight than it was, was before. Um, in spite of what was said before, the company still raised new capital for further growth of the business model described by, uh, by, by Tim in a few sheets, uh, sheets ago. And of this 2.2 billion, 45% of these proceeds will be used for further growth in the number of restaurants. So meaning also further growth in the links to deforestation in, um, in Brazil. Um, this while you know, China's prospectus supplement, which was of course related to this uh, su secondary listing in Hong Kong, um, neglects deforestation risk. Uh, there is uh, the, the supply chain, the, the, the deforestation in supply chain is not uh, seen as a material sustainability issue in this uh, in this uh, prospectus supplement, and then you can raise the question whether investors are really informed and are able to discount this risk in the valuation of this company. That's why that question mark is there. Um, after the listing, the share price came, came, came down by more than 10%, up to 14%, from 58 to 51. Um, but, well, the, the, was this due to the further COVID impact, which was uh, circling around that news in, in the world, uh, because that could impact, uh, impact fast food restaurant sales. We know that in, in the first half, the turnover was down 13% at Yum China, and the operating profit was down 56%, including Forex, excluding Forex exchange, it was around 50, 54%, so nearly the same. And well, is, is, are there any further risks ahead for, 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 for investors? Um, and i like to talk about that in the next slides. Next slide, please. Yes. So when trying to analyze, analyze uh, this, uh, maybe three investor risks uh, are worthwhile to, to talk about, which, uh, which really dominate. Uh, 
Tim already uh, spoke about the reputational risk. I will come back on that uh, later. Uh, financing risk is an issue. Um, but first, let's, let's, let's talk about Young China's revenue growth model, which might be threatened by, by four uh, factors. Uh, first, the, the health concerns, and that might be related to, to meat consumption. And this is, of course, related to the COVID-19 which raised the awareness of zoonotic diseases and also uh, perception of contaminated imported meat uh, uh, can, uh, and that these can, can affect imports and these can affect the whole uh, growth model, the whole uh, uh, consumer attendance at the restaurants at, uh, uh, of Young China. Uh, there can also be consumer concern about the effects, effects of uh, deforestation. Uh, the US-China trade war, of course, will consumers remain loyal to those dimension Pizza Hut, KFC, which clearly have an American appearance if this trade war further escalates. And uh, last but not least, it's the uh, uh, will the restaurant sales be structurally affected by social distancing? And um, if we go to the next slide, I will show you an, uh, several, several numbers. If these four factors, uh, health, deforestation, US, China, and social distancing, if they would really have an impact on, uh, on revenues, what is the impact on the value of this company? Well, a minus 1%, if we look to that, to the, to that column, if the revenues go down by, by 1%, the impact on the EBITDA will be around minus 18 million. And this value impact might be around 303 million if we use a DCF um, multiply factor of 17, looking to the low cost of capital for this company. And the, uh, the total, uh, relative to the total equity value, it would be 1.6%. However, if we go uh, further to a uh, structurally minus 10% versus the current uh, uh, investor expectations, uh, then uh, the, uh, the impact can be much larger, around 3 billion. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, versus the current equity value, it would be around, uh, around 16%. So that is... Uh, quite a substantial uh, number. Um, next slide, please. Another, uh, uh, the, the second investor risk might be, uh, might be the, the financing risk. Well, is this really a big issue is the question. Uh, this company is primarily financed by shareholders. So the, uh, after the 2.2 billion uh, secondary listing, which was new money, uh, there is even uh, a net cash position, and uh, banks are nearly not involved in financing this uh, this company, uh, and also bondholders are nearly not involved. It's mainly shareholders, which uh, which is uh, around uh, one hundred percent of the uh, enterprise value of this company, and uh, within this group of uh, of investors, the, there are primarily it are American investors. And uh, most of these investors don't have any policies on deforestation. However, there are some asset managers which have uh, uh, deforestation policies and even zero deforestation uh, policies. And then we are talking about BNP Paribas, uh, Norsius Bank, uh, Legal and General, and even J.P. Morgan is moving into this direction. Well, this is in total around 1 billion, and I must say only 1 billion, uh, 1 billion uh, USD. And because that means only 6% of the current financing of this, uh, of uh, Young China. So um, the other 94% have nearly no deforestation policies. And because there are not, there's not much need for refinancing debt, for instance. Uh, the engagement opportunities with this company do not come from debt uh, investors, but should come from uh, from these uh, well, these 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 mentioned um, 
shareholders which do not have a very big size in total with that one billion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, reputation risk. Well, that is, let's say, a little bit the overarching uh, methodology in this case, in this UM China case, because, well, there is not much of extra cash uh, financing risk in this, uh, in this company. Um, we have two methodologies in reputation risk. Uh, first one, which is, uh, which is in the in, in, uh, shown in the report and in an earlier report at Chain Reaction Research, uh, we come, if, if a company continuously has reputation events and does not react in a good way on it, uh, then uh, the negative impact on the equity value can move up to 29%, which is quite a substantial number. If a company reacts quite adequately on uh, reputation events, improves its uh, communication, improves its policies and execution, they can even gain 20%. But if the company neglects anything around deforestation, does not take action, like Jim China seems to be doing, the risk can be 29% in the equity value. An other methodology that we use, a little bit of a sanity check uh, in this case, it's looking to uh, how is the current valuation versus the peer group. Uh, and if we look to the current valuation, uh, that's let's say that's around 23% in a relative PER, P, PE ratio versus the current peer, peer group. That's in the column in the middle. Uh, that is substantially ahead of the five year average, which was 10%, and also substantially ahead of the five year low level, uh, when everything goes wrong, etc., minus 21%. The same is true for the two other valuation multiples, if we look to them and the implicit share prices which belong to let's say if yum china would be valued at the uh, at the uh, at the average of the of the of the of the five years of the preceding five years would be around four, uh, 40 uh, 40 euros 39.7 so there would be a substantial risk uh, if the company would become valued at this level again and if it would go to the lower uh, range, lower band range of, of the five below, then we could even move to a share price of 34 uh, US dollars. Uh, and they are in total, that means a an, an, an risk of 5.7 billion US dollars, which is 31% of the equity value. So yeah, with this, the reputation risk can have uh, after the um, uh, market access risk, the financing risk, the reputation risk is a little bit of an overarching risk. And this gives, shows you that there is st could still be further investor losses ahead uh, on top of the over 10% that we have already seen. And with that, I'd like to hand out back to Matt. Thank you very much, Gerard, and also thanks to Barbara and Tim. So now we're going to turn to our special guest, Jesse Waxman, shareholder advocate with Green Century. She will discuss what investors can do when engaging with companies that are exposed to these deforestation risks. Hi, Matt, um, and all thanks so much for having me uh, on today. Um, before I get into this slide here, I just want to uh, to note a few things about the the state of play right now. As I'm sure many folks are aware, the uh, Chinese market um, and demand for soy and Brazil Brazilian soy and Brazilian beef um, has been increasing um, in the last few years, both because of the U.S. trade war with China um, and because of the country's increasing demand for meat. Um, one of the uh, impacts of this on the uh, soy and beef supply chains around the world um, is that China compared to uh, US and European markets doesn't have a strong demand for sustainability. Um, 
engaging with companies in our experience has uh, sorry engaging with with Chinese companies in our experience has been a little bit different because the uh, pull of sustainability that we find um, for uh, consumer demands or just greater market trends doesn't exist as much in China, which makes uh, some of these engagements a little more interesting. Um, therefore, I think it's an important for investors to see a little bit how some of these commodities flow throughout the market, uh, the market to, to understand where opportunities for um, engagements exist. So the first slide here um, is looking at the flow of Brazilian beef into China. Um, I want to highlight both that uh, China, either by way of the mainland or Hong Kong, is obviously a big importer of Brazilian beef. Um, but I do want to note that a lot of this is flowing through uh, three main um, exporter groups. Uh, so three main meat packers, JBS, Marfrig, and Minerva. Um, the next slide. You can see a similar trend for soy, um, and here the, the impact is perhaps even greater. Uh, a lot of Brazilian soy is really flowing to China, and again, that's by way of a select number of um, grain traders and exporters. Um, highlights among them are Bungie, Cargill, EDM, uh, Louis Dreyfus, Amagi, and others. Uh, so there's, there's a concentration both in the uh, beef supply chains and the soy supply chains of the, these exporter groups um, that not only export to China, but are also uh, primary commodity suppliers for a lot of American um, and European multinationals as well. Um, next slide, please. So as investors are thinking about what it is they can do to engage uh, companies in their portfolios to address uh, deforestation risk, there are a few, a few ways that uh, investors can take action. Uh, the first is to engage with companies in the portfolio directly on their supply chain, um, talking to companies about their uh, risk exposure and how that exposes them to operational risks, um, supply chain risks, reputational risks. Um, one of the things that we have uh, been talking to a lot of companies about is not just how it is they're managing their own supply chains, but how it is they're looking at the operations of their suppliers more holistically. Um, you know, deforestation is not just a concern for an individual uh, company's supply chain, but it has farther reaching impacts, um, whether that's on agriculture in the region um, or on uh, broader, uh, you know, uh, systemic risks like climate change. So engaging with suppliers is a great way um, to Help change uh, some of a, help change the downstream companies at risk portfolio. Uh, so engaging with some of those grain traders and meat packers directly, um, the JBSs, the Bungies, et cetera, of the world can really help shift um, supply chains for companies like Yum China, but for many others as well. Um, a lot of those engagements are already ongoing um, through different investor initiatives. Um, and aligning what the uh, asks are and talking to companies about established best practices are really important uh, so that investors are sending a consistent signal to companies about the, the changes we'd like to see. Um, there are a lot of ways to learn more about uh, those ongoing initiatives and, and understand what those uh, collective asks are. Um, one of the great ways to uh, learn more about this work is to join uh, the PRI working groups on deforestation. Uh, the organization has two, one on, focused on soy and cattle and a second on palm oil. Um, there are other uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives as well that are welcoming investor support. Um, there's a palm oil transparency coalition uh, which is really trying to push uh, for greater transparency in the palm oil supply chain so that uh, both companies and investors have a full understanding of uh, any company's sourcing practices to understand exposure to deforestation. Um, and my understanding is there is uh, work happening to launch a similar coalition for soy supply chains. Uh, the other multi-stakeholder initiative I'll mention is the Statement of Support for the Sahano Manifesto. Um, it was an initiative launched 
two or three years ago at this point uh, to support uh, an end to deforestation and natural ve vegetation conversion in the Brazilian Cerrado, uh, which is a landscape uh, threatened by uh, conversion largely for soy and beef production. Um, there are, like I said, great ways to, to get involved and even just learn more about these ongoing initiatives. So please feel free uh, to, to reach out. I believe my contact is on the next slide um, if you have any questions about um, engagement or, or how to get involved with some of these initiatives. Great. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Um, we will now move to the Q&A part of the event. So if you have any questions, please uh, type them into the Q&A function and we'll try to get to all of them. Um, the first question, uh, this is something that Jesse touched on, but I'd like to open it to all the panelists. Are there any, uh, are there any opinion polls from China on attitudes toward forest conservation? And if so, could consumer opinion affect behavior by Chinese companies? Well, I can maybe try to answer that. Um, there isn't much. Um, I have looked for polls in the past. Maybe I missed something, but what I have come across is a I can't remember now who actually did it, but it was a poll among a, a range of large consumer countries, including China, asking consumers about their their preferences for uh, when they make purchases, how they would decide. And actually, the the figure that I remember for for decisions related to sustainability issues was comparatively high, also in comparison with markets where where you would uh, expect, expect it to be higher, but uh, questions around responsibility and the brand behavior were, if I remember correctly, higher than 85% named. Obviously, surveys are always a bit difficult because it's easier to say that you're concerned about it and then the decision may eventually not be impacted by it, but the awareness is certainly there as well. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can also add uh, to that. Uh, the, in, in the report, it is also mentioned that um, that the uh, that the Chinese millennials they are more interested, and there is research on that in ESG issues than their parents. And uh, that same research also shows that this might impact their investments, the investments by millennials. So, yes, it is. It is. It. In, in, on the investment side, it is clearly developing. Great, thanks to, thanks to both of you. Um, the, the next question is about the major uh, Chinese trader, Kafko. What might the effect be of, of Kafko's sustainability commitments on the uh, Chinese supply chain? Barbara? Maybe. Yeah, Kofco is certainly um, one of the the important players in agricultural commodity trade between uh, all kind of um, um, supplying countries and China. But if we look at um, um, soy and beef, there's also a lot of other of the the leading international traders that are highly relevant. Certainly, Kofco is um, within China a very interesting company because they have a lot of uh, subsidiaries that are also um, involved in, in downstream processing activities. So, so a change in their sourcing could in that sense also be very interesting and, and influential because of the large market presence. Yeah. Great, thanks Barbara. The next question is for Jesse. What overarching objectives or policies do investors pursue when they engage on deforestation issues? And are there any um, interesting shareholder resolutions at the moment? Sure. Uh, so on the first, we're looking for companies to be addressing their forest risk exposure comprehensively. Excuse me. <coughs> 
Um, what this looks like is, uh, I would say, a few key points. One is uh, setting commitments that are time bound around um, all of the relevant commodities to source uh, deforestation free. Um, and ideally in line with NDP sourcing standards. So no deforestation, no peatland conversion, no workforce exploitation. What that actually looks like uh, varies a little bit by region. So you have peatland development in Indonesia, but you'll have more um, native vegetation conversion um, as the concern in areas like the Sahado. But, but broadly speaking, there's a move um, away from deforestation and um, other native vegetation conversion. Uh, so that's one part. We're looking for companies to fully understand their sourcing and supply chains, so having full traceability of their direct and indirect suppliers. Um, and we're looking for companies to have uh, a way to engage uh, with their suppliers, both to communicate their own uh, sourcing preferences, but also to understand that um, there need to be consequences for uh, supplier non-compliance, whether that looks um, like supplier suspension or working uh, together with that supplier to come back into compliance, um, but understanding that uh, company setting policies really requires um, action throughout its supply chain when those policies aren't being met. Um, so I think that's, that's at a high level uh, series a couple of years ago put together um, a document on uh, KPIs, which I think is really useful, um, looking at you know what the best practices of a forest policy are, and, and touches on many of these points. Um, as far as shareholder resolutions, uh, there is currently one filed at Procter and Gamble, um, looking to have the company address. Uh, deforestation and forest degradation throughout its supply chains. Um, I think that one is uh, coming up for a vote in the next week and a half. Um, there are likely going to be other uh, shareholder resolutions on deforestation this filing season, although um, we are just at the, the beginning of filing season, so I don't know of any others um, necessarily being filed just yet. Great, thanks a lot, Jesse. This one is for Harard. Um, are there um, are the large institutional investors withholding in Yum Brands proactively taking part in um, deforestation engagement in, 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 uh, initiatives with the company? Uh, to be honest, I don't know, um, and maybe Jesse knows more about this than I do. Uh, Jesse, do you have any? Um, any anything on this? Sorry, I'm just pulling up that slide again. That lists all of them. Um, and now I can't seem to find it. Um, my understanding is so some of the the main asset managers, uh, I think, was, was mentioned already, don't uh, have rigorous policies on uh, whether sorry on deforestation either for um, investment purposes or engagement purposes. So a lot of uh, the ones listed, um, they're not involved with uh, some major uh, coalition efforts, I would say. Um, BlackRock did publish, I think last year, um, a policy on how it is they engage companies that have exposure to uh, deforestation through palm oil supply chains. Um, but a lot of those, uh, top investors are not involved in, in some of the uh, collective uh, engagement efforts, unfortunately. Great. Thanks, Jesse. So the next question is, um, are there links to Yum China and US companies KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut, or is it only franchising? Yeah, that's, that's, that's maybe a question that I can, can answer. Um, Yum Brands, um, that's not about a franchise. Yum Brands is license, licensing the brands to Yum China. So in fact, it's it's a very good question. Um, so through that link of the licensing of the brands to Yum China, Yum Brands is also earning money on the expansion of um, 
Young China in China. And uh, in that way also is earning money on the, on the uh, further increase of uh, links to deforestation in, in Brazil. So that are the links, but it's not a franchise link. It's a it's an license link for uh, tens of years. I think it is, it might be 99, something like that, but it's quite a, or 49, it's quite a long period. Great, thanks Gerard. So the ne next question is about um, COVID-19 and other food safety and other food safety issues. Is it possible that that these might lead to an increase of interest in alternative proteins such as plant-based meat? Uh, Tim. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Um, I think that that is really interesting and it also links into the question that we talked about before when about the uh, uh, consumer polls. Um, so what we have seen come out of uh, some of the uh, consumer market research firms uh, that do research in China is indeed that you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, I think around the world has really questioned people's reliance on, on complex food supply chains, uh, the sustainability as well as the health and uh, food safety considerations there. And I think in China, the way that has played out is that there is a sort of a renewed interest in more plant-based proteins, uh, you know, Chinese uh, uh, cuisine traditionally was much more reliant on plant-based proteins than it is today, and so it seems like there's a there's a, a willingness to maybe maybe go back to it, coming out of of uh, you know a fear of contamination, and a few months ago with the with the uh, scare of a new renewed outbreak on a you know Beijing food market that may be linked to imported fish, I think that that. Uh, um, concern has been most prevalent for imported meat products. So we've done a, a report uh, recently on JBS, which is a Brazilian meat company that is increasingly reliant on exports to China. Uh, they may be particularly exposed to yeah, uh, changing consumer preferences coming out of uh, uh, COVID and other related concerns. Um, and I think for a, for a company like Young China as well, this this will force them to to really uh, consider, as we've seen with other uh, fast food companies, to to offer more plant based protein products. Great, thanks a lot, Tim. And with that, we have concluded the um, Q and A part of the presentation. So we are going to wrap things up right now. We really appreciate everybody's time today and. Uh, for joining us for this event. We will have a recording on our website in the next few days. So thanks again, everybody. We really appreciate it.